I remember one day sitting in rehearsal and I was so grateful to myself, to my ancestors, to my grandmother, to my family, to my mom for making sure that I always showed up as myself. Because here I am sitting in this rehearsal room, being who I am and showing up 100% as Nicole, authentically Nicole. And that's what I want for my other teatristas, theater workers, community in matriarchy theater. You always get to show up as who you are and you will be cared for and you will be valued and you will be seen and you will be loved and there's a place for you. And we get to create what theater is. Nobody's gonna tell us what it is. We get to say what it is. You're listening to Building Our Own Tables, a podcast produced for HowlRound Theatre Commons, a free and open platform for theatre makers worldwide. I'm your host, Yura Sapi, and I'm the founder of various organizations and projects, including a 501c3 nonprofit, a six hectare farm and food sovereignty project, an LGBTQ plus healing and art space. And I've helped numerous creatives, leaders, and other founders unleash their excellence into the world through my programs, workshops, and coaching services. In this podcast, I'm showcasing the high vibration solutions for you as a visionary leader to implement into your own practice and thrive. Stay tuned this season to hear from other founders who have built their own tables for their communities, and for the world in this evolutionary time on Earth. You are here for a reason, and I am so honored and grateful to support you on your journey. So stay tuned and enjoy! Community unlocks abundance. We have gone through this in the podcast before. Bonus points if you can identify which episodes. In today's episode, I got to interview Nicole Limon and we discussed all kinds of leadership tips and strategies as usual, really centering around the opportunity that comes from what it means to build your community, what it means to support community, to give and to receive from community, and to operate from this community-centered way of leadership. Nicole is such an amazing example and role model in this way with her new theater company, Matriarchy Theater. Go ahead and enjoy this episode. We discuss fundraising strategies and tips the power of mantra meditation for you as a leader and founder, and the journey of finding your name for the project or organization you are creating, and the journey overall of what it's like to really go from an idea to a manifestation of your idea into this 3D earthly realm. So I hope you enjoy this amazing episode. Before we get into this episode, go ahead and hit subscribe on this podcast. This is the best way to stay updated on new episodes, and it helps build a thriving planet where all beings experience joy and harmony with each other and Mother Earth. So go ahead and hit subscribe and keep this good energy flowing. Welcome to the podcast, Nicole. Thank you so (laughs) much for being here. Thank you for inviting me. I'm really excited to talk to you. Yes, me too. So my first question is, tell us about your superhero origin story. (laughs) So what, what is the pivotal moment that led you to forge your own path and build your own table? Yeah, that's a great question. I think it was probably both a long and immediate process because I was raised with such unconditional love in my family, I knew my value. I knew I was loved. I knew I was cared for. As a young person, I felt like I was smart, you know? I think when I got to college, there was this instant invisibilization of people who looked like me and walked through the world looking like me. And to me, that was a very kind of shock. 
I wasn't used to that sort of an experience. And that was in the theater department and not getting cast, not getting called back, just to do what I love, which is telling stories. And very quickly after that, I met a friend and we started our own little company. And it was called Movimiento Molcajete. And it was a duo, two performers. And we started writing our own work and touring our own work. And we realized immediately that there was an audience for our stories. There was an audience for people who look like us, that there was no lack of embracing of our stories. And I was probably in my early 20s at the time. And we did that for several years. We were able to sort of make a living just going to small communities, to community colleges, to tribal communities, to festivals, and to art galleries, etc., being invited to share our work. We knew there was value right? And that it was directly for our community. And I think that was really important. Fast forward many years, I wanted to create a larger theater company to give that sort of an experience to other theater makers and other people who are just curious about the theater world or performing or storytelling. And so Matriarchy Theater was kind of a kernel for many years before it became matriarchy in what 2020 2021 it was really just the having other people be seen too that's so I feel like that's the superpower is like I see you and I want you to see yourself that's the gift mm, I love that I'm curious about having started in 2020 2021 at this transformative moment for the planet and for humanity yeah. also marking a future that's here and coming yeah. Yeah. In terms of a lot of the shifts that we have seen and are going to see for mm-hmm. the planet, for humans on it, and theater as a specific community of that, really representing the human experience. So I'm curious about this this time that you you know decided to come out, and now how has that been, and what are you reflecting on since that? beginning. Yeah. So like I said, it, it had been a kernel for a long time. And actually in 2016, I left my full-time gig, you know, like my day job where I was making a living and taking care of my family and my children, but really just not, my soul was not happy. Uh, I had been there for almost 10 years and I left because I wanted to f- just focus on my art and my teaching. I was also teaching part-time at Sac State at the time. So working full-time job, teaching part-time, doing my theater. And I just wanted to focus on building my art world and really reconnecting to that. And so my intention was to start Matriarchy back then. I didn't have the name yet. I still just knew it was a theater ensemble or a collective or a company. I didn't know what it was going to be, just something. And at that time, my dear friend and mentor and former professor, Manuel Pickett, asked me to help him kind of save and sustain his company, Teatro Espejo, which is celebrating 50 years next year. And he's, you know, he's just like, I need help. It's, and I thought that was a really beautiful thing to reach out, to ask for help. And he asked me to direct the next main stage show, right? He's like, I'm tired. As leaders, we're often doing this this by ourselves, even though we have a lot of people come to the table to collaborate on a show, behind the scenes, it's often just us running it. So after conversations with him and other folks, I decided to really commit some time to that. So I said, kind of internally, I was like, okay, I'm going to give this maybe five years to just help Mm -hmm. save this company. It had been a company that was a part of Sacramento State University on campus until 2012 when he retired. He then moved it out into the community. And so I helped to create a 501c3. We founded a board. I was the first board president, you know, recruiting people, outreaching, bridging the gap of generations, right, between him and the people um, under me and just kind of coming, you know, or under the generation, really working to sustain that and grow that while still wanting to start my company. I knew mm-hmm. that there was so there's so much value in Teatro Espejo, and it was where I was sort of like born and raised as a teatrista, and where mm-hmm. I really learned about theater for social change and community care, and so it's it was just such a joy and such a passion to do that. And then at some point around 2020 21, when theater started going into into these little you know podcasts in, in cubicles and in Zoom rooms, and I did about 
I think I directed about three or four <laughs> Zoom plays. I think I just finally had some time to settle because Teatro Espejo had taken a break from being, you know, in a theater. We were still doing Zoom theater, but I had some time. And I think it was that time that at some point the name came to me. I never really knew what I wanted to name the theater company. And one day I just was like, hmm, it's tricky theater. And so I remember immediately just doing a search, right? Checking it, Googling it, seeing, you know, is there already a matriarchy theater? Is there um, the dot com available? Because I didn't want to step on anyone's toes and I would want to uplift their work, right? And I, I was surprised that I was like, wow, there isn't one yet. Of course, there's lots of matriarchy projects and everything, which is like to me, it's community. Right. So I immediately went and like got the domains, you know, and I remember the next day during the pandemic, there were, a, you know, we had the racial uprising and I was supporting a lot of my students of color who were going through it and themselves becoming leaders and activists and creating organizations around social change and racial injustices and calibrating those just injustices, right? Because of that, I had formed a beautiful collective formed under my friend Nicole Manker called the Communities of Color Collective. And it was primarily adjunct faculty from the university. Mm -hmm. And we would meet every week on Zoom, every week for almost two years. And so the next day that um, I came up with the name, I remember meeting with them and I said, I have a name for my theater company. And they um, were like, what is it? And I told them, and I just remember, I still get a visceral feeling of their reaction to Mm -hmm the name landing with such resonance and such um, power and the celebration emojis in the in the zoom window and i knew i had found the right thing because it wasn't just a name but it was like such an intention such a big Mm -hmm. intention and so that really i felt like it took that time of the colonel and then those years dedicated to teatro espejo for i think the universe and ancestors to give me the gift of matriarchy theater. And then I can go forward with what my mission is. Yeah. That's so beautiful. (laughs) Yes. And I love everything I'm hearing, bridging this ancestral wisdom really of the power of a name, the power Mm -hmm. of receiving a divine kind of information coming through that just is a knowing of when it's mm-hmm. the right time kind yeah. of. when that information comes through for anybody who's listening who maybe is thinking about starting a project and you don't have the name yet yeah being able to kind of flow with that with that journey of getting the name and knowing what it is that you're doing and also meant to be doing and then when it comes through really going ahead and taking the steps to follow this vision and I love too the the offering of community as a part of it this community group that you had been a part of in you know providing a space for others to share and a space for you to share and be heard so Mm -hmm. I feel like that's also a really important thing to to note for others who might be in this process to really have that community have that space of people that you can go to and share and celebrate wins and also yeah you know have that space to to be supported and then Mm -hmm. also the tips i'm hearing around too (laughs) going forth and getting those domains and you know searching to see (laughs) have it something that legally in in this way that we operate other people have already been doing yeah both for yes you know the the whole trademark and legal side of it But also the community side of it is that wanting to uplift what others have already been working on. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to reflect back all this amazing wisdom, suggestions and experience that you've gone through to share with listeners. Yeah, thank you. It's, It's nice to have that because sometimes we don't see it ourselves. We're just in the doing. So in the sort of receiving that, I appreciate that. Yeah, and definitely, you know, there's a lot of questions that come through. And I'm sure you still have questions. I still have questions about things that <laughs> oh, we're, yeah. we're doing. So it's it's always good to be able to find those spaces to ask. Yeah. Because you're listening to this podcast, I'm going to assume that you care about the future of our planet and all beings who live here. 
You are a visionary leader who sees possibilities for our future that are beyond what others around you may be thinking and taking as the status quo. You have the ability to see another option and see a different way to do things than before. You're bridging ancestral practices with the modern and you know there's a reason you're here on this planet, in this body, with this voice, in this moment. So I want to invite you to join our free network of visionaries, an online platform and community forum cultivated by me, Yura Sapi, to support other visionaries who are building their own tables. Join us and gain access to weekly self-care tips guided by the astrological occurrences that reflect in our socio-political day-to-day, as well as resources to grant opportunities, business tools, curated for you to thrive as a new earth leader. Get access to my special meditations, teaching videos, and giveaways for one-on-one coaching sessions, courses, and more. So what are you waiting for? Join us on the Network of Visionaries and let's manifest our thriving planet. The link to join will be pasted in the show notes and I can't wait to meet you. So my next question, imagine if you are giving a pep talk to this younger version of yourself, what are the words of encouragement and wisdom that you would share? That's that's such an interesting question because I feel like part of me does that with my students, right? Mm -hmm. In retrospect, where we're able to see like we could have done X, Y, Z and been just okay. You know, it wasn't as scary as I had thought it was. And so I really try to empower my students with those things. So for me, I think I would tell, would have told my younger self, particularly like maybe my college age self, is to speak up more. I think it was a process I had to have for my life because in my real life, when I'm not in my theater or my teaching, I'm pretty introverted. I'm very much just sitting back and observing. I can, I feel much more comfortable speaking maybe in front of 10,000 people than on a one-to-one. I've gotten much better with it. But I think that's what I would tell my younger self is to speak up more. You know, right now, for example, I tell my students, like, go talk to your professors. You know, Mm -hmm. they're just people and they, they want to help you. They want to connect with you. I tell my son that too. Go talk to your teachers. Go make a connection. He sees how much of a difference it makes, even though it's scary for him to make the connection. So for me, it's just making connections. And I think it's still a lesson that I'm learning, right? So I can tell people do this, but still having to practice that for myself. Because I think one of the things that we do, I think as um, community folks, I feel like I'm always uplifting other people. Like I love that. And then sometimes I'm like, oh, I could uplift myself too, right? I could open doors for myself as well. And so I think this last year I was able to do that. And that was the probably the older version of me telling the younger version of me, like, you can do this for you too, (laughs) right? You're part of the community. You're part of the community that you're caring for. So yeah, speak up, speak up. Yeah. Yeah. Well, tell us more about what this last year has brought you. Yeah. I mean, abundance. (laughs) (laughs) So, and I would say probably from 2022 and 2023, we're just overwhelmingly abundant and joyous and just seeing Mm -hmm. things come to fruition and offerings coming in, in a way that I hadn't really experienced before. In 2022, I actually, we finally staged our first full performance for Matriarchy Theater, a play called Quantum by Tara Moses. And it was a beautiful experience. And I would say that at that time, I had finally, you know, launched Matriarchy, said, we're here, we've been born, here's the name. And then I did a a small GoFundMe. And I hate asking for money. (laughs) I'm not a good fundraiser. I just don't like doing it. And so I put it out there, you know, which was a huge ask for me was it's the speak up thing and that we didn't do too well it did pretty good I mean we had a little bit of donations and I was so grateful for that and but we didn't get anywhere near the ask that I was hoping for but we still ended up getting that by other means so at some point the board of Teatro Espejo came to me and said we would like to fund your first production for Matriarchy Theater Mm -hmm. And so they gave me a 
a lovely budget to put this show on. And I thought that was amazing. I cried. <laughs> I wasn't expecting that. You know, I wasn't expecting that. And it still gives me tears. I was able to do every single thing that you need to do for a production. All my artists were paid. All the designers and creatives were paid. We rented the venue. We paid for the rights. We did publicity. Everything that you need under the sun. They even paid me. Like Teatro Espejo paid me to direct my show for my company, which, you know, that was not some, yeah, that was not something I was expecting. And it was, it was again, a gift that I I did I didn't do things for Teatro to get things back like that, but it was just, started and all of this abundance really started snowballing in such yeah. unexpected ways. I also started doing mantras just around welcoming those things and yeah. you know the abundance and the care and I'm cared for and the universe will do what's right for me as long as I'm putting good out into the world and that was 2022. And then I also, as much as I don't like asking for money, I also am not really a big fan of writing grants because I want to spend that time making my art, right? So, but I did. I finally applied for a grant and I received an NEA grant, which was huge. It was probably yeah. the first, yeah, it was probably the first grant I had applied for in years. And I got the grant and I have to give big props to the grant advisor I had talked to prior to applying. He gave me some really good advice. And then I was able to put that funds towards a project that we put on stage in 2023. And kind of a long story short, in 2023, at some point, I did that thing where I took my own advice and spoke up for myself. A a director put a call out for a dramaturg in the community and her name is Dina Martinez and she's such a trailblazer and such a beautiful human and she's a director and an actor. And I immediately answered like, oh, I, I, I suggested somebody, you know, and I said, I can do it. But also there's this other person like I don't want I don't like putting myself out there. But she immediately messaged me back and said, I want you as my dramaturg. I was like, oh my God. I know. <laughs> you know, <'cause> it's, <laughs> I've been doing dramaturgy for a long time, but never like quote unquote professionally or where I'm actually being credited for my work. And mm -hmm. so her bringing me on board to do that opened a bunch of doors for me to continue doing dramaturgy, to continue doing my intimacy choreography work. And I told, I, she actually came to speak to my class the other day because I'm doing dramaturgy for her production of Fade right now. And I told her, you know, I'm always opening doors for people. And I said, I want to thank you so much for opening doors for me because I'm usually not putting myself out for opportunities like that. I'm always just making sure that all my people have opportunities. And so I said, I'm so grateful for you uh, at my ripe old age, giving me the chance um, to do that. And so, yeah, it's, you know, it's that, and that's to me that that's the community care. That's the community care. And it's also a testament to women, right? Mm -hmm. Having each other's backs. Yeah. Women of color having each other's backs. So Matriarchy. it's been an amazing <laughs> two years. <laughs> yes. I'm so happy for you. Thank I you. <laughs> love everything, all of this manifestation work. That's definitely something that I really resonate with and understand and just mm -hmm. you know what you were saying about you know putting the GoFundMe out there and still getting everything you needed just in a different way so I yeah. think that's a big part of a manifestation of when you have a vision and you create a plan being able to flow with what the universe gives you that actually yeah. can sometimes be even more than you could have imagined than what you kind of planned for and then I love the use of the mantra meditations. That's something also that I have gotten into and even gotten trained in now as a oh, really? meditation teacher. Yeah. Oh, with, nice. And our meditation uses mantras nice. um, in this way because so some of the science, if anybody is interested, it's called the reticular activating system. And basically mm -hmm. it's this part of our brain that allows for a type of signal, a type of GPS coordinates input. For us, yeah. it's like when a dog gets a scent and then is able to kind of have that scent available and what it's able to be looking for and finding outside in the yeah. world. So in that same way, when we use mantras, when we use an affirmation, when we visualize something very specifically, we are calling that energy into our own and therefore start to notice it when it's around us. So maybe yeah. it always was there. Maybe there was always someone who 
had information or who was the next step to something that you were looking for, but you never had the conversation about it. Or, Mm -hmm. you know, maybe you end up going to an event that just intuitively calls to you and you sit next to the person that exactly is needing, is giving you what you need. (laughs) So that's, that's, you know, the, the beauty and the, the work of this affirmations of this meditation of this kind of mm-hmm. calling in and really focusing in our power as humans. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm so happy for you and all of the, the amazing success you've had, the abundance, the, the shift into that perspective. And I also will say Tara Moses, amazing person. We've yeah. had her on the podcast. So oh, you can nice. check out that episode too. I totally will. I totally will. We did a yeah. we did an interview or what do you call it? Instagram live with her, I think on opening night when we did her show. I love her. Yeah. And I've read all of her plays that are at NPX. I've read every single one. They're so just so great. Yeah. 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 I also would love to tap more into the conversation on fundraising I think yeah let, let's like get into a little offering of tips because you have some information on grant writing and I can definitely share <laughs> on the individual giving so the crowdfunding I actually have an article that I wrote a couple of years ago interviewing the movement theater company and giving mm-hmm. 10 tips for crowdfunding campaigns because actually the successful campaigns worked in a similar way that you ended up working with in terms of having people that were already organizations or people that were already kind of committed to the project before mm-hmm. launching the crowdfunding campaign. Yeah. And this actually functions a lot in the way that individual and fundraising strategies and departments work. This is yeah. from my learnings from graduate school and from working at the public theater, actually. Yeah. In the oh, nice. So there's basically strategy that goes on before you even go public about mm-hmm. a fundraising Pain. So this is where also if you're able to secure a matching gift, so a, someone who is going to match a certain amount of donations, you're able to then actually bring that in into the crowdfunding space. And a lot of people are very motivated by the idea and the knowing that their donation will be worth double in terms of if they give, it'll, this money will be matched. And so yeah. there's that tip. There's also no, letting people know about your crowdfunding campaign before you launch it so that you have people that are already going to donate in those first few days. And really I'm going to write these, I'm gonna write these tips down. <laughs> these such good yeah, tips. Building the I'll, I'll add the link in the show notes as well. Yeah. To this article. Yeah. There's, there's so much strategy, so much support that you can have over individual giving and, and really all of these aspects of leadership. I think with this community aspect too, for listeners to really open yourself up to receiving support, receiving Mm -hmm. wisdom. As leaders, as founders, we are often called to do a lot, if not everything. So (laughs) there's plenty of things that we can, you know, turn to people who have done these things, who have experience, who have the wisdom and receive that. So now I'll pass it to you. And if you'd like to share some of the tips you got on grant writing. I mean, I would say, because I'm not a huge grant writer and, you know, I'm not... I would say that particular grant, the reason that I applied for it was because it was an individual artist grant and you got to just propose the project you wanted to. You didn't have to fit into a box, which for me is really challenging. I want, you know, organizations that I work with to to organically create from the heart what they want, not to try to check off boxes. And so that's what drew me to that particular grant. So I had an advising session and Going in, I knew that I had two ideas in mind, and I knew that whether or not I got the grant, I was still going to do those projects. And I think Mm -hmm. that for me was like, you know, we either are going to get this support or we're not, but we're still going to forge forward and we're going to do the project. We're going to figure out how to do it. So I proposed two projects and I spent most of the advising session talking about one particular project and the advisor was so generous with their time and advice and that project was Quantum, right? Mm-hmm. By Tara Moses. That was that. I think it was before I set up the GoFundMe. I don't remember. And I said, so I want to do this play, da, 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 da. And the very end, we we're about, our advising session went on for a while because we were having such a great conversation. And then at the end, I said, oh, let me just tell you about my other idea. I propose the idea and he goes, that's the one, apply for that. Mm-hmm. And I was like, okay. So he gave me, he talked for me for like maybe a minute and then he had to go because we had already been going over time. And I was like, okay. So I think one, it was a clear idea. Two, it was like such an, from a, such an authentic place. And three, it was, I already knew I was going to do it regardless of whether or not 
I got external funding or, or yeah. this particular grant. And that ended up being my project, Just a Pinch, a Uterus Play, about health mm-hmm. advocacy around women and women plus people with uteruses, reproductive care, mm-hmm. you know, at outpatient um, appointments. And so, yeah, so we got the grant for that. And again, I knew it was a project that I was going to do regardless because it didn't check off boxes for others. It was aligned with what we wanted to do with Matriarchy Theater. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. It it also kind of reflects back to this manifesting speech I was talking about in terms of, Mm -hmm. you know, you have what you are wanting to do. And so with that core, you're able to attract the things that will help you. Mm-hmm. Um, by sticking to that, you know, that core thing of what you're looking to to manifest. Yeah. And I I love the the tips of, you know, seeing if you're the right fit energetically. You can kind of um, almost mm-hmm. know when you read yeah. when you read a description, is this right for me? Is this are they looking for something else? You know, kind of almost scanning through if it's something that, you know, has some red flags or yeah, you know, yeah. there's all kinds of things that you might want to be um, aware of when you're applying for a grant in terms of mm-hmm. what do they require for the reporting. Similarly, the match, like a matching aspect to it where you need to be raising funds mm-hmm. for it to be able to get that, yeah. which I think it's also ties to your second recommendation around really knowing that you're going to do a project and having other options out there mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. can actually, for a lot of grant opportunities, really support your application because whether they have a matching component to it that you do need to be able to, you know, have other funds coming in. But also there's this aspect of saying, you know, these are the other ways that we're getting support for this. These are other partners that are already with us. These are the ways that we're going to do this. And so a lot of times grants and organizations and people want to support something that is being supported by Mm -hmm. others. And so kind of Mm -hmm. joining in on the community aspect of yeah. being able to to co-produce something. So yeah, I love those tips and I really hope that it helps for people who are listening. <laughs> yeah. Also, I really love that you were talking about like, you know, scanning the grant to see if it's right for you. And I think one of the things I always say, my favorite thing about being an artist is that I get to be around other artists. So when we're scanning those, a lot of times I know that if we aren't the right fit, that we're sending it to other people mm-hmm. because there's enough for everybody. Like there's going to be times when I don't get the funding, but my friend or organizations that I love are getting the funding. And I feel like there's enough for everyone to go around. And so if it's not right for you, send it to the person you think it is, right? Because we're all we're yes. working to, 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 to do the same thing, which is bringing beautiful art into the world. Yeah. I love that. And that goes back to what you were saying too about the jobs that come around. It's beautiful. Yeah, I actually, I have this network of visionaries free community forum mm-hmm. that I've started where I can post all kinds of, you know, healing and teaching information about this type of work for leaders and founders and visionaries. Mm -hmm. And then also there's one for grant opportunities where I just post all kinds of grant opportunities. I used to have a newsletter, but this I found is a little bit easier for me to just kind of post it in there and then it's on there and anyone can see it, you know, the past history too. I always feel so loved when somebody sends me a link to a grant, even if it's like, even if I look at it and I'm like, oh, it's not for me. I just feel so loved when they're like, here, you might, you might qualify for this. I'm like, thank you. (laughs) I appreciate you thinking about me. (laughs) Yeah. It's like good energy. It's like Mm -hmm. receiving that support, that prayer Mm -hmm. from another that you want to see. Yeah. That belief and faith in your work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Amazing. I have another question for you about your ideas and thoughts around the future of the theater industry. As the theater industry evolves, what do you believe it's asking of us as creators and leaders? Your questions are so good. I mean, I think the theater world is such a big entity. Because community is so important to me, I don't care to answer to the theater field or the theater world. I care to answer to my community, right? And theater is the means by which we get there. You know, the storytelling is the means by which we get there. I will say that as leaders, when I'm thinking about people who are part of our community, whether they're youth or younger people or older people, you know, they want 
us to be, for me, when I'm leading, I kind of usually start with like, I'm fallible. I will make mistakes. I don't have all the answers, but I know what my goal is and I know what my mission is. And I know that I come with good heart to try to do this thing, you know, and you're welcome to come in and bring your energy, you know? Um, so I think leading in a way where we're human and we show up as our authentic selves and that we're willing to, you know, apologize if we make a mistake and be that human person, but also try to hold ourselves up to a standard where it's not the regular thing that we're making a mistake, but that, you know, we don't have all the answers. I think that's one thing. And I think another thing as a leader is to get out of the way so that mm. other people can lead. Right. So I've said since I started matriarchy is that I'm not building matriarchy for me. Right. I'm building it so that I can give it away five, 10 years down the road. We've built this thing together. Now I'll take it if you want it. Right. It's just carving out a space that we get to collectively create. And so that we're leading together. Like I might be the person who kind of started the thing, but I can't continue it alone. What is even the point of that? We talk often about the notion of decolonization, right? And I also talk sometimes about a pre-colonized space, right? Where we are flattening the hierarchy. And that's something that I try to do within matriarchy is we definitely have people who have roles as the director or the artistic director or the lead or whatever the case may be. But when it comes to the community care, we try to flatten the hierarchy while also having channels in place should, you know, we just did just a pinch and we had a wonderful artist, Bessie Zoldo, come in and talk consent and boundaries and mental health advocacy and conflict resolution. And we had a chain of, you know, if you are having an issue and you haven't been able to talk it out one-on-one, -on -one, you're going to go to this person. You know, if it's an issue with Nicole, you can go to the board. If you have an issue with the board, we don't have a board. We have a, we have an, we have guiding matriarch. You can go to a guiding matriarch. If not, then you can go talk to Bessie so that everybody feels truly cared for and that they have a voice. And so I think it's about, you know, getting out of the way of these notions of what is a leader, just like I like to get out of the way with the notions of like, what is professional actor? What is a professional theater? Uh, my standards are not the standards of a PWI. Like I don't try to align to that. Professional is what we want it to be what we want it to look like. And so as the theater world evolves, right, I don't think we answer to it. I think the theater world answers to us to a certain degree. Yeah. That's beautiful. Thank you so much. <laughs> right. I have one more question for you. Mm -hmm. So reflecting on your journey, what has been the most rewarding aspect of carving your own path and building your own table? Yeah, I would say, man, it, it's been a long journey, yeah. but, but very, very intentional. I think one of the things when we are building our own tables or creating our own path, it's because we know that the other tables don't fit. Like, I didn't even want to be at the other tables. You know what I mean? I was, a lot of us aspire to the X, Y, and the Z because that's what it looks like. I never really did. I just wanted to show up as myself. And so I said no to a lot of projects because they didn't align with my core and my heart. And I've had conversations with other theater makers where it's like they feel like their career suffered because of having to say no to things that they believed in. And I certainly feel like, yeah, I had an intention to to show up a, a way that I wanted to show up. And so I had to say no to a lot of things. And mm -hmm. I'm okay with that because I also have the other end of the spectrum where I have friends that say they're doing well in their career, but they had to kind of compromise who they were. And so they're in a place right now where they're really, really going up against a battle with a lot of diff just different things. And I think that we can all understand that. And I didn't want that to be my battle. I was like, that's not my battle. Why should I be battling that when I could be creating something beautiful? And so for me, the, the biggest reward, and I've really recognized this the last couple of years as I've been pushing forward with matriarchy and also in my freelance work as a director and a dramaturg and an intimacy choreographer, mm -hmm. I remember one day sitting in rehearsal 
And I was so grateful to myself, to my ancestors, to my grandmother, to my family, to my mom, for making sure that I always showed up as myself. Because here I am sitting in this rehearsal room, being who I am and showing up 100% as Nicole, authentically Nicole. It took me a really long time to get here and get in this room, but I'm me. And they're embracing me and accepting me and seeing me as me. And that is the biggest reward. And that's what I want for my other teatristas, theater workers, community in matriarchy theater. You always get to show up as who you are and you will be cared for and you will be valued and you will be seen and you will be loved and there's a place for you. And we get to create what theater is. Nobody's going to tell us what it is. We get to say what it is. Yeah. Yes. (laughs) <laughs> Amazing. Thank you so much, Nicole. Yes, everyone, please go ahead and follow, subscribe, like oh. Matriarchy Theater. You can find them on Instagram, right? Mm-hmm. And thank you so much again for joining us today. It's been such a pleasure and honor. Thank you. It's been such an honor. And I'm just really grateful for, for this time with you. Thank you so much, Yura. This podcast is produced as a contribution to HowlRound Theatre Commons. You can find more episodes of this show and other HowlRound shows wherever you find podcasts. Be sure to search with the keyword HowlRound and subscribe to receive new episodes. If you love this podcast, post a rating and write a review on those platforms. You can also find a transcript for this episode along with a lot of other progressive and disruptive content on HowlRound.com. Have an idea for an exciting podcast, essay, or TV event the theater community needs to hear? Visit HowlRound.com and submit your idea to this digital commons. Star seeds. We are the star seeds.